Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hello, wildlings. Well, if you've got that pesky employment taken care of, and you've gotten to the point where you're fairly sure you're in no danger of being summarily terminated, you may be okay. Or you may be just familiar enough to open up a new box of peevishly Pandoric problems, as in tonight's tale. I'm a cinema usher. We have some strange rules. Part 3. By Drunken Swordsman. My name is Sean. I've been a cinema usher for three years now. My cinema has some rules that you should never, ever break, even if you think they're insane. If you're confused, you should probably start at the beginning, or at least listen to the previous two episodes. One of the rarest rules that we have is Rule 7. I've only ever experienced it once about six months ago, and I sincerely hope that I will never have to deal with it ever again. Rule number 7. If you notice shadows being out of sync with your surroundings, return to the last room you were in as quickly as possible, alone. Close the door, then return to the lobby. Until you do so, do not touch your shadow under any circumstances. The biggest danger that you can face in this job is becoming too used to your surroundings, is becoming too used to the weirdness. That's the mistake I made with rule number seven. I dropped my guard. I stopped paying attention. I had walked to the other side of the lobby from room six before I realized that I had no shadow. Cold sweat covered my brow. I looked back to the way I'd come. My shadow, completely disconnected from me, lay on the floor by the door to room six. Another usher, a man by the name of Liam, stood between me and it. He was looking straight at my eyes, a narrow grin on his face. I had to think quick. Uh, whatever was going on, I had to get back to room six, but with Liam in my way, I had no route to get there, not without confronting him. Sean, is everything all right? David called from the door to his office. He sounded concerned, worried even. Could I answer him? Would that just make things worse? I ignored the question and started heading back to room six. The more I looked around me, the more clear it became how strange my surroundings had become. Every shadow was thrown in a different direction as if each was illuminated by a different, unique light source. I was nearing Liam now. I slowed down, walking in a manner I hoped would appear nonchalant. If I could just get past him and to the door, David asked you a question, Sean, Liam said. The thin smile was plastered over his face. He stepped in front of me, barring my way. I heard him, Liam. I just forgot something in room six is all. And what was that, Sean? What did you forget? He knew. I could see it in his eyes. Liam, or... Er the thing masquerading as Liam knew what I was trying to do. It knew I wasn't fooled by its act. I heard the office door open behind me. Footsteps approached. Sean? asked David. What did you forget? He walked around me to stand next to Liam. I had to convince them that I didn't realize anything was wrong. I couldn't get to room six otherwise. Even if I did make it there, the rules said that I had to be alone. They couldn't follow me. I forgot to clean up a spilled drink. I'll just get some paper towels from the garbage room and go finish it. I smiled weakly, cursing my quivering voice. It was a bad lie, and I could see it in David's eyes. He wasn't convinced. Liam, uh, help him out with that, would you? He said, walking away to the office. Liam smiled at me again. It was a horrible sight. Well, let's go, Sean, he sneered. 
We walked to the garbage room. My mind raced as I tried desperately to think my way out of this situation. Liam was watching me from the corner of his eye, waiting for me to make a run for room six. A desperate plan formed in my head. It was a gamble, and for all I knew, the other rules of the cinema didn't even apply in this place, whatever it was. But it was the only way to escape that I could think of. We entered the garbage room. Liam wasn't even acting inconspicuous anymore. He was looking straight at me, still smiling that horrible grin. With Liam following, I walked to the back of the garbage room and punched him in the face with all my strength. The thing wearing his body stumbled backwards, surprised, and in the second of time it bought me, I scrabbled at the air duct in the back of the room, opening it at the last second. The thing's fingers grabbed me from behind and turned me around to face it. The look of humanity that Liam had worn before was shedding off like a snakeskin. His face grew disproportionate, his eyes pools of shadow. He laughed in my face. I knew you weren't fooled. I knew it. Well, playtime's over. Time for you to meet your shadow. It sniggered insanely. I hope you like it here, because you're going to be staying with me. I kicked out desperately, fighting against the thing's strength as it gripped my arms. I managed to turn us around, ramming its back into the open air duct, and it screeched in pain. Ever since your master has made his foolish rules, I've been alone. Well, no more! First you, then him. Finally, I heard what I'd been desperately hoping for, a sound coming from the air duct behind Liam. The scuttling of many tiny feet. The thing had only a second to realize what I'd done. Its eyes widened. No! Then it was ripped backwards as a terrible force tore in as a terrible force tore it into the vent. Bones cracked as its back and legs bent in angles they were never meant to. Then it was gone, screaming and cursing. I stumbled my way away from the wall. I had very little time. As I ran across the lobby towards room 6, the thing wearing David's body tore out of the office. It screamed in frustration as it sprinted towards me. I reached room 6. My shadow coiled on the ground, trying to reach me, but coming just short. David was near, meters away from me, a cry of anger and desperation filling the air. I flung open the door, jumped inside, and slammed it behind me and silence dropped like a stone. Cautiously, I opened the door again. The lobby was empty. I looked down and heaved a sigh of relief. There was my shadow, once again at my feet. Rule number eight. If a garbage bag begins moving violently or making noise, dispose of it in the special chute in the garbage room. Do not open the bag. One of the jobs that we have to do here is to clear out the garbage room after every shift. This means loading all the trash into a trolley and taking it to the basement parking lot where a truck will come and pick it up every week. Rule 8 is probably the worst after rule number 4. It's not as mentally scarring, but it can still fuck your head up if you think too much about it. It certainly made me pretty miserable when I had to deal with it the first time. This was about a year back. I was almost done with the trash that day. One more trip with the trolley should have done it. I was looking forward to the end of my shift and the warm embrace of my bed at home. That's when a garbage bag spasmed, dropped to the ground with a wet organic thud, and started screaming. Help me! Oh God, please help me! I screamed and jumped back. The, the bag writhed on the floor as whoever was inside it strained against the thick plastic. Then it cried out again in panic. God, please let me out! I can't breathe! My heart was pounding. With shaking fingers, I reached for the bag to tear it open and free the person trapped inside. I grabbed at the plastic and froze. Rule 8. The thing in the bag screamed in pain and fear. Is anyone there? 
Please, you have to help me. It started sobbing, the plastic shaking and curling in on itself. A chill ran down my back. The, this thing sounded human. It sounded as if it was in pain. It sounded real. But this place had taught me not to believe anything that I heard or saw. Cautiously, I took a hold of the bag, and a hand shot out of the writhing mass and grabbed my arm. I yelled and stumbled back, breaking the thing's grip. Help me! You have to help me! I can't move! I can't breathe! I can't... The arm had been real enough. I could still feel its grip where it had caught me. The arm had been human-sized but no human being could have fit into that bag. I grabbed the twisting, amorphous mass. The hands grabbed at me through the plastic as it screamed for help into my face. Staggering with its weight, I lurched over to the garbage chute and dropped it over the edge. It caught on to the edge with its hands. Please, please, it whimpered, almost whispering where before it had been shouting. I can't go back. Please don't. I brought the lid of the chute down on its fingers. It screamed, slid down the chute, clawed at the sides as it disappeared into the dark, and went silent. Rule number nine. If anyone exits room three during a show, do whatever they ask. Inform the manager immediately. For all the wrong reasons, this story isn't like the others I've told. The story will be different, and I'm not sure I like that. I'm not sure where it will lead me and where it'll lead this cinema, because this story happened yesterday. Even though David has warmed to me in the time that I've been working here, I think he might even trust me. He hasn't said anything about Room 3. To be fair, I've been too afraid to ask. So Rule 9 has always been a source of mystery and no small amount of apprehension. No one I asked could even remember a time when they would have to obey it. Strange though it may seem, no one had ever exited room 3 during a projection, at least not in the years that I've worked here. No one could remember David ever explaining the command or even talking about it. Rule number 9 was as big a mystery as the room that it concerned. So nothing could have prepared me for yesterday when the door opened and a smartly dressed man walked out of room three. I froze in my tracks. No amount of experience in this job could have prepared me for that. He walked over to me as I stood staring in amazement and fear. Good evening, sir, he said. His voice was flat, emotionless, a blank slate. But unlike the thing from rule number four, it was unmistakably human. Um, good, good evening, I stammered finally. The man smiled in slight amusement. I wish to speak to the manager. Shit. Right, um, right this way, sir, I replied, trying to fake a calm I didn't feel. I wish I could have told the thing to stay, that I could have warned David, but... It was as if my brain was in ice, sluggish and unresponsive. We walked over to the office and entered. I didn't even have time to say anything. David looked up, saw the man, and went sickly pale. Rule 9, Sean? Yes. Leave us, please. Wait for me outside. I obeyed. Nothing could have made me remain in that room, absolutely nothing. I exited into the lobby and waited. Time went by, I could hear the murmur of conversation from inside the office. Occasionally David's voice would rise in volume and I swear that at one point I heard him weeping. It was half an hour until David opened the door and walked out. He was even paler than before, like all the blood had left his body. His hands shook very slightly, but I noticed. In the second before he closed the door, I could see the room behind him. It was empty. The man had gone somehow. David? I asked cautiously, not knowing what to say. Is, um, is, 
everything. What happened? David fixed his eyes on me. They were red-rimmed and bloodshot. Go home, Sean. Get some rest. Sleep. Prepare. Why? Prepare for what? We're going to break rules 10 and 11 tomorrow. Mm, I loves me a good cliffhanger. And you, my friends, will just have to wait until our series finale to find out what those rules are and what it means to break them. Until then, stay scary, never trust an independent shadow, and make the most of your nights. <laughs>